This is a revision video for AQA GCSE Chemistry or Combined Science, looking at the very first chemistry unit, atomic structure and the periodic table. In this video, we're going to go through the key facts that are listed in the specification, the things that make up 40% of GCSE science, which you need to be able to recall. You can download the questions from the description below and use these to make flashcards or test yourself and then check the answers using this video. For GCSE chemistry, you should know that there are about 100 elements. You don't need to know a more exact figure than this. The elements are listed in the periodic table of elements. Compounds are substances made from more than one element, chemically combined in fixed proportions. Chemically combined is AQA's way of saying bonded, and if you use this terminology, that's still perfectly fine. While fixed proportions means that there's always the same ratio of elements to each other, so we can represent this using a chemical symbol like H2O. Compounds can be separated back into their elements by chemical reactions. These compounds are named sodium chloride, magnesium oxide and copper sulphate. There isn't one official definition for a mixture, but you can think of this as a substance that contains more than one element where those elements are not always bonded in a fixed ratio. So that might mean that they're not bonded at all, or it might mean that sometimes they're bonded one way and sometimes they're bonded another. You can separate a mixture by filtration if it includes an insoluble solid, which won't dissolve, and a liquid. To separate out a soluble solid, you need to use crystallisation. This involves putting the solution into a water bath or on a Bunsen burner to remove the liquid. Distillation is not an example of a chemical process because there are no new chemicals made. Fractional distillation and chromatography can both be used to separate out mixtures of liquids, but in fractional distillation we want to be able to extract these liquids and use them for something afterwards, whereas chromatography is an analysis technique. British chemist John Dalton described atoms as indivisible spheres, and he compared them to billiard balls. JJ Thompson's plum pudding model talked about the atom as being a ball of positive charge with negative electrons spread throughout it like the plums in a plum pudding. The nucleus was discovered by Ernest Rutherford and his students Geiger and Marston using the alpha scattering experiment. This involved firing alpha particles at gold leaf. Niels Bohr then adapted the nuclear model by saying that electrons orbited the nucleus at fixed distances. In 1932, James Chadwick discovered the neutron and this had important implications for isotopes because it was able to explain the differences we'd seen in mass data. An atom is the smallest part of an element that can exist and it's approximately 0.1 nanometers across, which can also be expressed in standard form as 1 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. Around 1 ten thousandth of the whole atom is the nucleus, so the rest of it is all empty space. The atomic number of an element tells you how many protons it has, while the relative atomic mass is how heavy it is compared to carbon-12. This is slightly distinct from the mass number, which tells you how many protons and neutrons in total are in the nucleus of that atom. The three subatomic particles that make up atoms are protons, electrons and neutrons. Protons have a charge of plus one, electrons of minus one, and neutrons of zero. It's really important that if a question asks you for relative charges, you give these numerically. It's not sufficient to just say positive, negative, neutral. The relative masses of these particles are one, very small, and one. You may have been told to use one over 1840 or one over 2000 for an electron, and these will be accepted, but your specification just lists the mass of an electron as very small. In the nucleus, we find the protons and the neutrons, and atoms have no overall charge because they have the same number of positive protons and negative electrons. You can calculate the number of neutrons in an atom by subtracting the atomic number from the mass number. Isotopes are different versions of the same element that have the same number of protons but different numbers of neutrons. Electrons are found in the atom's shells, and when drawing atoms, you need to start by placing electrons nearest to the nucleus. That first shell can only fit two electrons, and in the second shell can fit eight. In the third shell, you can put up to eight electrons before you need to start drawing the fourth shell. In the modern periodic table, we arrange elements in order of their atomic number, or how many protons they have. The columns of the periodic table are called groups, and the rows are called periods. The metals are found towards the left and the bottom of the periodic table. 
Elements in the same group have the same number of electrons in their outer shell, and this leads them to have the same chemical properties. The table is called periodic because periodic means occurring at regular intervals, and we find that the same chemical properties come back at regular intervals throughout the table. Early versions of the periodic table placed elements in order of atomic weight. This was because atomic number didn't exist as a concept yet because protons hadn't been discovered. Early periodic tables were missing elements because these elements had not yet been discovered. Dmitry Mendeleev was the first person to leave gaps in the periodic table for elements that he thought hadn't been discovered yet, and he made predictions about the elements that would come and fill those gaps. He also switched over some elements that didn't fit the properties of the group that they should be placed in. This was all solved much later when we discovered protons and atomic number and realised that the atomic masses didn't always go up in the same order as atomic number. Scientists adopted Mendeleev's table because the predictions he made turned out to be true. Group 1 are also known as the alkali metals because when they react with water they produce alkalis, metal hydroxides. When lithium reacts with water it makes lithium hydroxide and also hydrogen gas. Being an alkali, lithium hydroxide can be tested for using universal indicator, which will turn blue, and to test for hydrogen, you ignite the gas, which will burn rapidly with a squeaky pop sound. The atoms of lithium, sodium, and potassium all have one electron in their outer shell. As you go down the group, the elements become more reactive. This is because that outer shell electron is lost during reactions, and as you go down the group, the outer shell electron is further away from the nucleus. Because the atoms are larger, it's easier for that electron to be lost, because being further from the nucleus, it experiences less attraction. There's also increased shielding because there are more shells between the outer shell electron and the nucleus. If you compare how potassium reacts with water with how lithium reacts with water, the potassium has a more vigorous reaction. In terms of what you actually see, this means that more bubbles are produced, the potassium moves faster over the surface of the water being propelled by those bubbles, and also it's very likely that it will ignite, it will spontaneously set on fire due to the amount of energy being released by this exothermic reaction. And if that happens, the potassium burns with a lilac flame. The group one metals are kept in oil to prevent them from reacting with water and oxygen in the atmosphere. When the group one metals react with chlorine, they produce metal chlorides. These are white, salty looking substances. And when they're produced, the green chlorine gas will disappear and you often also see a very bright white light. Group one metals are much softer and less dense than the transition metals. And they're also poorer electrical conductors. The group one metals are soft because of their metallic bonding. Because each atom is only contributing one electron rather than the two or three that are seen in the transition metals, this is going to make the bond weaker as is the fact that each one of the metal ions only has a single positive charge rather than a 2 plus or a 3 plus charge. Group 7 are also known as the halogens, and the atoms of fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and indeed all of group 7 have 7 electrons in their outer shell. As you go down group 7, the elements become less reactive, and this is because when they react, they're going to gain an electron, so this is kind of the opposite of the alkali metals. It's harder to gain an electron in a larger atom, which is what we get as you go further down the group, because that electron is further away from the nucleus, so it experiences less attraction to the nucleus, and also there's increased shielding from those inner shells. The group seven elements are found as diatomic or divalent molecules, which means that two atoms are joined together in one molecule, such as Cl2. As you go down group seven, the boiling point increases, and this is because the uh, molecules are getting larger, so there are stronger weak intermolecular forces. Group zero are also known as the noble gases. The atoms of helium, neon, and argon all have full outer shells, and this makes them very unreactive and unlikely to form compounds. As you go down the group, the boiling points increase due to the increased strength of the forces between the atoms. Finally, if you're sitting the GCSE chemistry papers, in other words, the triple science papers, you need to know about the transition metals. These are found between group two and group three of the periodic table. These metals are typically hard, have high melting points, and are good conductors of electricity and heat. They're also harder, denser, and stronger than the group one metals. Interestingly, the transition metals are good catalysts, they form colorful compounds, and they make ions with different charges. So for instance, 
iron can produce Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus ions. The transition metals are used to make jewellery because they're relatively unreactive and therefore they remain shiny for a long time. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you found that a useful refresher of the key facts listed in the specification for your GCSE chemistry exams. If you did find it useful then don't forget to like the video and subscribe below for more GCSE chemistry content coming soon.